Good evening and welcome to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. Tonight, oxygen. And our talk in this next segment is going to be from Jennifer Fraser. Jennifer is a biologist here at the Exploratorium, who, I have to read this, whose current obsessions, says uh -oh. obsessions, include plankton and data visualization. That's true. Data visualization. And so Legos. She's been at the Exploratorium since 2004, and she's focused on finding new ways to help visitors explore the worlds they normally can't see. What a cool way thing to do. So thank you for coming. I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer and hope you enjoy this. We're going to talk about plankton and oxygen, but since it is Thursday night, I've added some special icons because you're going to leave with a few takeaways. Two special tidbits for your co holiday cocktail parties and a moment of mindful meditation so you can really center yourself, feel grounded. I've heard it's on the cover of Time magazine. So you may already come in here knowing something about plankton. Maybe in sixth grade biology, you learned that it was the basis of the food web, brought all the energy into all the living things you actually care about, like lanternfish, mackerel, even flipper and dungeness crab, which I'm sure you've been lamenting we don't get this Christmas. Or maybe you know that plankton are really beautiful because you bought a cool vintage poster in that store on Valencia Street with the dead lion in the window. Or perhaps all you know about plankton is that it's an angry, angry nemesis of SpongeBob. And I'm not going to judge you if this is all you know about plankton, but I will tell you that plankton don't have feelings. <laughs> they don't have eyes and they don't have teeth. But if that's what you think, it's okay. All are welcome here. <laughs> but just to make sure that we're on the same page, uh, we're going to do a little definition. I'm still not sure how these things work because I didn't go to a very good public school. But because I was like playing ten. So the definition that I found was a diverse group of organisms that live in the water column of large bodies of water that cannot swim against a current. So the important thing is planktos. Plankton comes from planktos, which is Greek for drifter. And it's actually not just microscopic creatures. People think of plankton as teeny tiny things, but even those giant crazy jellyfish, like blah, look what washed up because of the blob. Those are also plankton, anything that cannot swim against a current. So it's actually not a taxonomic term that would be on an evolutionary tree. It's sort of a descriptive term that people tend to use. But if you want to sound like a real scientist, you don't really use terms like plankton. You say marine microbiology or other things that make you sound really impressive. That's actually cocktail party tidbit number three, but I didn't include that. <laughs> so enough definitions, enough cartoon characters. Let's get back to you, because that's why you're here, right? So let's think, just imagine underneath you right now, underneath your chair, underneath the cement, down in the bay right now, there are plankton. So this is an image that one of our biologists here, I have to click on it in this window. Um, if you collected a sample from the bay right underneath you right now, the, and looked on a very high-powered, expensive light microscope with an HD camera, this is what you would see. So the things moving around are animal-like zooplankton. I'm, I'm not sure how to use this Rudolph pointer. I can try. All I want to do is just use it for the holidays <laughs> with some sort of... I'll try not to do that between the microphone and the light. Um, so they're the animal-like zooplankton, so zo or animal, and there are the plant-like phytoplankton, which we'll talk more about tonight, as Ron hinted at. So that's what you would actually see in the bay if you were looking with a light microscope. But there's a lot more that you can see if you had a more high-powered microscope. So some of the other things, if you could zoom in even further, are, well, this is what you would see with an electron microscope. So there are a lot of bacteria in the bay and the ocean beyond. This was an image taken with an electron microscope of some marine bacteria. They actually don't normally have these disco colors, so this is a colorized micrograph. And also with an electron micrograph, you would see viruses. So they're actually marine viruses. These are not dangerous, scary viruses that are going to make you sick. They're marine viruses that are actually part of the natural marine ecosystem and actually play a really critical role in our atmosphere and climate cycles. So they're good viruses. So maybe someday, just like you think of like 
you know, you go to Whole Foods and say, can I get some like probiotics? There'll be some sort of like pro viruses, but um, now we're on to cocktail tidbit number one. See, this is your little takeaway for the night. I didn't fill this with a martini because then this talk would have been a little bit more sloppy. <laughs> but if you actually had this martini glass filled with bay water, there would be 2,607,000,000 living things in this cocktail glass. If you count viruses as living things, which I do. Um, so think of that, 2,607,000,000 living things in this cocktail glass in your bay. That's a lot of living things. But, so use that one over the holidays. You don't even have to give them my name if you remember it. <laughs> but let's face it, nobody wants to be a number, not even a plankton. Even though they don't have feelings, it's not like they want to be number 997, 331,000. They are living things too. They reproduce, they die. They contribute to their community. They do stuff. And one of the special things that phytoplankton do, remember those are the plant-like plankton? I'm gonna get my little Rudolph thing here again. So inside, this is one of the larger types of phytoplankton. It's a protist, if anybody here likes or knows about protists. So one of the special things that phytoplankton can do is they can make energy from the sun. Um, wow, how you may wonder. Well, so if you zoom in, if you were to look at these green structures, this was a, a light micrograph taken here at the Exploratorium by our microscopist, Christina Yu. So these green structures inside this diatom, a diatom is a kind of phytoplankton, these are called chloroplasts. So these are the same things that you'd also find in a plant. And now is when we get some like cool science textbook graphics because chloroplasts are where this reaction actually happens that can take energy from the sun and do all sorts of stuff to it. And for tonight, what really matters is that it produces oxygen. So if you were to look at a chloroplast, so half of this is an electron micrograph and the other half is sort of more of an artist's rendering. The, the only thing that I think is a really important takeaway is that these chloroplasts, these are the structures where photosynthesis is happening. And the way that I like to think about it is they're full of chlorophyll, which is the pigment that can absorb photons from the sun. And the thing to think about is that they have all this surface area. So they have these membranes that are spanning all throughout the chloroplast. And I kind of like to think about it like solar panels. If you really wanted to get a lot of energy from the sun, you wouldn't just have like four solar panels. You'd have solar panels all over the place, which is I guess what they're doing out in Nevada and other wastelands where they want to try to like make energy from the sun. So that's kind of like what's going on in a chloroplast. And similarly in bacteria, they have, they have their membranes filled with structures that can harness energy from the sun. So there's a chloroplast, and if you looked in even closer, you just keep zooming in, here's an artist rendering of that membrane that's inside the chloroplast, and this is called the thylakoid membrane. And inside this, this is, this is a watercolor, but it's based on actual like protein structures. It's done by an artist named David Goodsell. And the real takeaway from this is that like all of our cells, whether it's flipper, dungeness crab, a diatom, you, all of the cells are filled with proteins and proteins are where the action actually happens, right? You can keep zooming in and zooming in and zooming in and proteins are where a lot of these chemical reactions take place. So in this case, I'm not actually going to show you chemical reactions. I'm just gonna sort of give you an overview from a textbook of what's happening inside those membranes. So when light from the sun sort of hits, this is that pretty, the artist rendering was a bit prettier, but if there were that membrane that's inside, so there's the sort of chloroplast up in the upper left. And if you were to zoom on in the membranes inside, you would see that as the light comes in, there's chlorophyll, which I'm sure you've heard of or you've gotten at a juice bar. Can I have a chlorophyll shot? I'm not really sure it's gonna do anything for you, but anyway. It's the pink bin in not just plants, but in uh, a lot of photosynthetic phytoplankton that they can absorb, the chlorophyll absorbs photons from sunlight. It sends them basically down through these sort of electron transfer components. So that's what that little green blobs with the little yellow arrows, that's really what it looks like inside your cells. I'm just kidding. This is sort of a educational diagram, but through this process, 
uh, an electron is lost from chlorophyll, and basically what happens is it takes it from water. So if you see down in the lower left, that little blue blob is water, and it, through a process called photolysis, water is split into oxygen and two hydrogen molecules. So that's kind of at the end of the day, you know, there's a much longer, like, when Ron showed that, like, photosynthesis, I suddenly felt like I'd had four mountain dews and my hair was in a ponytail and I was in the dorms again and started to have some very bad flashbacks because I don't need to know those, re those reactions anymore. Those flashcards have been burned in a barbecue with liquid oxygen. <laughs> so... All that really matters is through this process, you're splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen. So here's where it starts getting kind of crazy. If you think about, right, so th the number of diet, these are actually really, really big phytoplankton. About 20 of these would fit across the head of a pin, but there'd still be like 2,000 of them in this cocktail glass of bay water, and there are even more bacteria and viruses. So each one of those green blobs is a chloroplast. And when I showed you that picture, think of all the chloroplasts with all those membranes, with all of those proteins that are splitting water and creating oxygen. That's a lot of oxygen molecules. And then if you think about the fact that, so don't worry about the colors because it makes it look like the poles of Earth are on fire. The only intent of this movie is to show you, this is basically showing that almost all of the world's oceans are full of phytoplankton. So if you think of like all of these cells filling the world's oceans and all of them carrying out these chemical reactions all the time, that is a lot of oxygen, which leads to cocktail factoid number two for tonight. So I hope you're remembering these. If, no matter how many times you've visited Danelle at the bar, <laughs> cocktail party factoid number two is that Half of the oxygen you're breathing did not come from trees. I mean, I like trees too. I like forests. I don't want them clear cut or burned down. But the phytoplankton in the ocean is actually producing half of the oxygen you breathe. So you tell grandma at Christmas dinner and you just see what she says. She'll probably be like my grandma and say, what the hell is phytoplankton and why aren't you a doctor? <laughs> okay, so if you think of all that oxygen, this is actually probably a little bit abstract. I couldn't fit in. This is a zoom in on your on an artery. So pretend the top of that is your artery and it's been like severed, but maybe you don't want to imagine that. And the red molecule at the bottom. So just think of all those phytoplankton producing all that oxygen and now it's inside your red blood cell. So that's oxygen inside your red blood cells, in your arteries, in your veins, making your life possible. And this is where, so this is actually something that Melissa Alexander on our staff, we actually had some Tibetan artists here, and there is a diatom inspired by one of our images, and I didn't actually put like a full-blown meditation hall, but this is where you need, you can like close your eyes, and you can take a deep breath, full of oxygen made by ba the diatoms in the bay water, all of the bacteria, I forgot my Malaysian Tibetan meditation bell. But if you think of taking that deep breath, right, and all that oxygen is coming, those diatoms are probably not photosynthesizing right now, but they made that oxygen today. It's still sitting around here with the breath, the exhalations of nachos of some second grader. <laughs> You're breathing it in. It's coursing through your, it's going through your lungs into your red blood cells. And you can actually say it's not just like hyperbole. If you've ever been to a meditation and it's like, oh, you're connected with all life. You're like, well, yeah, I guess I ate some lettuce today and maybe a piece of salmon. No, every minute that you're breathing in, you're taking in something from the larger ocean, which I actually think is pretty amazing. So those are my thoughts on plankton and oxygen. I hope that you've left with some things that'll help you over the holidays and a little bit of interconnected with, with the universe. And... Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to take questions, but I will be around if people have questions, and thank you.